the jungle looked so soft and easy from a B-25 upstairs. But now, downstairs, the jungle looks very different. And there's a five-man crew in it somewhere. This is Sergeant Mel Ford, the gunner. Just a kid who used to work in a flour mill in Spokane, Washington, and never spent a day in the woods in his life. Since all of them but the pilot bailed out together, there's a good chance of being heard if he yells. Hello there! Hello! Hello! No answer. Not at first. But a little later, he hears somebody else yelling. And then he sees him. The navigator, Lieutenant Pat McVeigh, a steady, dependable guy who'd been a high school football coach before the war. A good man to have around in an emergency. Hello there, sir. Hi. Here. How are you? He all right? OK, fine. I, I... Sergeant Ford is worried about leaving his chute in the treetop, but that's OK. Since McVeigh has his chute, Fords will be a good marker for any searching plane to spot. Two more crew members. Four out of five accounted for. They're pretty lucky to have landed close by. If they hadn't, it would have taken a lot longer to get together. They have that much to be thankful for. And the nearest enemy positions are hundreds of miles away. McVeigh knows they're in a tough spot, but he also knows they stand a good chance of getting out if they keep their heads, and if they tackle the jungle as a problem to be solved, not something to be afraid of. The co-pilot, Lieutenant Pat Abbott from Pittsfield, Massachusetts, who'd been a little shaky, starts to relax. A good flyer and one of the leading amateur golfers in the country. But that seems a long time ago. And Charlie Tannen, radio operator and gunner. Oldest man in the crew with a wife and a baby he's never seen back home in Amarillo, Texas. Before they jumped, they'd agreed to meet their pilot at the plane, if possible. They aren't too worried about him. They figure Harrison has landed closer to the ship, and he'll be there waiting when they reach it. But Harrison isn't doing too well. He'd come down pretty hard. And he's suffering from a mild form of shock, so it doesn't take much to rattle him. It starts with a mosquito bite. And then he steps into a termite's nest. It hits him suddenly. This is jungle. He's miles from his crew, doesn't know where his plane crashed, and he knows next to nothing about jungle survival. Ignorance leads to fear. Fear and ignorance add up to panic. As soon as he protects himself from the swarms of insects, he takes stock of what he has, inspects his jungle kit for the first time in months, a little late. His mosquito gloves and head net are there, but his signal flares, and worst of all, his compass are missing. His fire starter is gone, too. No signal mirror. But he does have a machete, sunglasses, D rations, pocket knife, fishing kit, and first aid kit. Because he hadn't been wearing a shoulder holster, he lost his 45 on the way down. His sleeping bag is there, but he has no map, no canteen, and no jungle survival manual. Not what he should have had if he'd checked his equipment before takeoff, but enough if he keeps his head. Shoes are a problem. He hadn't worn GI shoes, and his low-cut Oxford snapped off when his chute opened. He's intelligent enough to improvise a pair from his seat pad cover. In jungle travel, feet are the most important means of transportation and need all the protection they can get. But panic makes him work too quickly, and his shoes aren't as good as they might have been.
An hour later, he's gone less than a quarter of a mile. And he has a serious transportation problem. Since he didn't watch where he put his feet, they're pierced by thorns and covered with stone bruises. His thirst is like burning pain, and panic makes him yell for Pat. Pat! 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 Yell when he knows he's miles from his crew. Desperation and anger, he fights the jungle. A futile battle which only exhausts him and makes him thirstier. And then he throws away his water. He doesn't know the rough barked vine he cut, like many other jungle vines, stores water. Pure water absorbed by the plant's roots. But his crew knows you can drink from any vine that flows clear sweet sap and that you must not drink from vines with only milky sap. Tannen also lost his shoes when his chute opened. He too improvises a pair from his seat pad cover. But for greater protection, he makes an inner sole out of the padding and binds his feet with strips of parachute silk. These shoes won't stand up under rough jungle wear, so he'll carry extra canvas for new ones. McVeigh knows it's a good idea to keep the men busy, keep them from thinking and worrying. So he begins to take inventory. The jungle kit is their most valuable piece of equipment. Among other things, it contains a frying pan insert, medical supplies, needle and thread, tea tablets and water purifier, signal flares, a compass, plastic water bottle and so forth. Basic equipment which experience and testing have proven to be most helpful. There are several types of these kits, and later models may vary slightly. Besides this kit, they have pistol belt first aid kits and parachute first aid kits, and their parachutes. As much of the parachute silk as possible should be kept. It has unlimited uses. Once you land in the jungle, it's not so much what you have as how well you use it. Materials should be conserved. Wherever possible, jungle substitutes should be used, such as vines instead of parachute cord, bark instead of cloth, or taking your food from the jungle instead of using up your emergency rations. They have the necessities. And thanks to McVeigh's thoroughness, an additional emergency personnel kit he'd had the foresight to put in his pocket before takeoff. The emergency kit is sealed for protection. It's a handy thing to have, for it contains some valuable extras. D-rations, adhesive, matches, bullion powder, benzedrine, and a waterproof utility bag. You share alike in the jungle, and divide your equipment into carrying packs suitable to each man's strength and condition, so that every man is supplied if by accident he should be separated from the group. Under ordinary circumstances, keep together. Although a man alone can get out of the jungle, it's safer, easier, and a lot pleasanter if you work in a group. There's a deep scratch in Abbott's back. The co-pilot doesn't think it's important enough to dress. But in the jungle, the danger of infection is magnified. It's hard to believe how quickly it can take hold. It's one of your most serious problems. To compensate for the loss of body salt through sweating, the kits contain a supply of salt tablets. They'll prevent heat exhaustion and cramps. Sulfonilamide powder contained in the pistol belt first aid packet and the parachute first aid kit is a lifesaver. Pouring it into an open wound will help control external infection and help prevent blood poisoning. The wound should be carefully bandaged for relief from insect bites, rashes, burns, or skin irritations, the boric acid ointment is very helpful. It should be applied freely as soon as possible. For smaller scratches, use iodine. 
It comes in handy stick applicators which are thrown away after using. You've got to keep your health. But you also need a plan. Studying the map, they work out their campaign against the jungle. They'll follow a stream and a river to their plane, where they should meet their pilot. Then, if rescue planes don't spot them, down the river to the coast, where chances of rescue are greater. But for a short time, they'll stay in the vicinity. Natives might come looking for them, if they'd seen the parachutes coming down. From flight data and time of crash, you have a pretty good general idea of where you are, especially if you have a reliable map. A compass will help when you travel. Even though it's still early, it's necessary to find a spot to camp, for night comes swiftly in the tropics. So they split up temporarily into two reconnaissance parties and agree to go only about a mile, searching for a stream, signs of native trails, or a native village. They blaze their trail as they go. In dense vegetation and tangled undergrowth, it's easy to travel in circles, even if you're jungle wise. Hey, what's the idea of lugging along that very pistol? Well, animals and snakes and things. A very pistol's swell for signaling, but it's not much good against animals and snakes and things. That part of the jungle is highly overrated anyway. You might see a few occasionally, but they won't bother you unless you start something. As for snakes, well, just watch where you put your hands and feet. Don't walk around barefooted. However, a forked stick is nice to have if you're unarmed and nervous. More important, it might be useful for catching small animals to eat. Yike! That couldn't be a snake, could it? Yes, but it's not dangerous. It's just a boa constrictor. A boa constrictor? You didn't have to do that. His main interest is in getting away from you. There are a few poisonous snakes. This is a coral. Species vary in different jungles, so it's well to know the kinds in your theater. This is a bushmaster. Even though he's the deadliest snake in the world, the odds that he or any other snake will bite you are about the same as you're being struck by lightning. So relax. An hour or so later, Tannen and Abbott come back without having found anything but jungle. Although it's hot and uncomfortable, and they're bothered by the strange jungle noises, they know now that jungle isn't as bad as it's been painted. Nothing like the exaggerated idea you get from too many Tarzan books. Tannen knows if you've got time on your hands, you want to keep busy. So he decides to lighten his pack. Every extra pound should be discarded. No reason, for instance, to lug around the padding in the jungle kit. So, cut it out. Abbott bones up on the jungle emergency manual in the kit and learns a few useful tricks. How to convert his parachute pack into a knapsack, for instance. The pack itself forms the carrying pouch and the web straps form the shoulder straps. Just a simple operation. It isn't long before McVeigh and Ford return with good news. They found a campsite not far from a jungle stream. So they get their packs together, make sure they haven't left anything they can use behind, and snake off single file into the jungle. They mark their trail well, in case natives or their pilot should cross it. Pitching camp near a stream puts fresh running water at their doorstep and gives them a front yard full of fresh water food. But to get away from mosquitoes and malaria, they pick a high spot 
a short distance back in the jungle. In making beds, the idea is to get a platform off the ground, above the jungle dampness and the insects. They make their beds by planting four stout upright poles in the ground. Supports and crossbars are tied down with strong jungle vines. For a mattress, palm leaves, or any large leaves at hand. And for sheets and blankets, the parachute. Silk sheets in the jungle. Not bad. With a whole jungle full of branches, wouldn't you know Mel Ford would pick one with thorns? Not only do the thorns prick, but they may be hollow. Queen ants sometimes lay their eggs inside them, and these branches are crawling. McVeigh also warns him about a plant with short detachable hairs on the pods. Hairs which will stick to your skin and cause violent itching. There are other plants to stay away from. Plants with thorns, barbs and stickers. But the little gunner is the kind of guy who'd sit in the only patch of poison ivy in five counties. And he did it too, back home in Spokane. It's a good idea to have a fire every night. Whittle some dry shavings. They'll burn easily. No point in using the fire starter unless it's really necessary. Save it for a rainy day. There'll be plenty of them. A dried termite's nest's a good base for the fire. Burn something like charcoal. Small twigs and bamboo husks make good kindling. Matches are scarce. Take precautions to keep them dry. And try to light your fire with only one. A fire has to be nursed along. It takes plenty of patience, but it's worth it. For jungle nights can get awfully cold. Besides giving you heat, a fire will keep away any kibitzing animals. Of course, fire is necessary for cooking, and its smoke will discourage mosquitoes and other pests. Finding dry wood is often a problem. Wood hanging from vines or standing dead trees may be dry. Wet wood can be split open and the dry heartwood used. Certain resinous and oily wood and palms, which are highly inflammable, will burn even if they're green. When the fire is well started, larger sticks should be laid on in a radial pattern. Burns better that way. Pretty, isn't it? But to Abbott, it's just a bathroom deluxe with built-in stall shower. Keeping clean is one of the best ways to prevent tropical skin irritations. Makes you feel better, too. It's still early enough so the mosquitoes aren't out in full force. But in an hour or so, toward dusk, it'd be too dangerous for Abbott to go around unprotected without all his clothes. A good thing for Abbott that McVeigh happens by. There are a couple of ticks on his back. McVeigh has to be careful removing them. A lighted cigarette held near a tick, not against him, will make him drop off. If you haven't a cigarette, put iodine on the beast or pry him out carefully with a knife. Ticks should never be squashed against the skin. Get the head out, otherwise it may cause serious infection. It's always a good idea to inspect each other at least twice a day for insects. You may look like a couple of baboons, but Baboons do all right in the jungle. Iodines applied to tick bites at once to avoid infection. Since clothing gets damp quickly due to the high humidity, let it dry in the sun when you can, or by a fire before dusk. Before putting on his clothes, Abbott inspects them particularly his socks and shoes, and liquidates any uninvited guests. McVeigh uses the waterproof cover of his sleeping bag as a water container. While he works, his legs are protected against ticks, ants, termites, chiggers, and other jungle pests, for he's tied his socks outside his trousers. He's doing a good job. Unfortunately, you can't say that about Harrison. 
Although it's almost four o'clock, late in the jungle, and he should have been getting set for the night, his only thought is to keep moving. Moving, in spite of the fact he doesn't know where he's going. He tries to orient himself, using his watch. The method is unreliable even in the temperate zone, and Harrison doesn't know it's useless near the equator. After a while, he learns from painful experience to go around obstacles instead of through them. He thinks he's getting smarter until he realizes with a sickening feeling in the pit of his stomach that he's passed the same spot twice. That's when he makes his first blaze. He might keep moving until nightfall, but by pure chance, he stumbles into a clearing, which looks like a good place to camp. The ground is covered with insects. So he uses his head for a change. He's learning slowly getting over his panic. But he's hot, tired, and thirsty. He hasn't had any water all day. He's dying for a drink. Yet he thinks this jungle pool is so brackish and polluted that his halazone can't purify it. He's wrong again. His crew knows halazone works wonders, if it's used properly. Two halazone tablets should be crushed and added to each quart of water. Shake the container thoroughly, then let it stand for half an hour. If you don't smell chlorine, add more halazone until you do. The water is then safe to drink. Water can be purified without halazone by boiling for at least five minutes. Mel has been left to guard the camp while the rest of the crew is out hunting for food. To make a baking oven, he scoops a hole by the fire and rakes some coals into it. He's caught a tortoise. Poor, helpless little creature. He feels sorry for it. Tortoise should be baked whole in the shell to preserve the natural juices. Birds too can be baked whole, feathers and all, and then cleaned before eating. But they should be packed in mud instead of leaves. After the tortoise is placed in the scooped out oven, it's covered with a layer of dirt, which acts as insulation from the coals you rake over it. In two hours, a dish that would cost five bucks at the Waldorf. Tannin is searching for the vegetable course. Plants aren't as nutritious as animal food, but they're a lot easier to catch. Fern tips, good eating. The young tender shoots have the most nourishment. Like most plants, they can be eaten raw or cooked. Bamboo ovenware. A section of green stem cut below two successive joints is a good kettle. Closed at the bottom and open at the top. It's so durable you can boil water in it. For flavoring, some bouillon powder. At the same time, Abbott is busy gathering nuts. High in protein value, they're a good substitute for meat. Roast them or boil them. In gathering food, don't be afraid to experiment. Most plants are good. Only a very few are poisonous. A general rule to follow is if a plant tastes bitter, it's not edible. Try some. A taste won't kill you, even if it's poisonous. And you can always spit it out. Not bad. Sprouted nuts. A salad course added to the menu. 
These nuts are a symbol of the variety of food all around them. They're learning a valuable lesson. No man needs starve in the jungle. Look funny? Well, if you're tempted to laugh, ask yourself a question. Would I do any better in the same spot? Harrison's big mistake was made before he got in the jungle. He didn't learn how to lick it, and he wasn't prepared. He's smart enough to build his bed in a low tree, and he's well protected against mosquitoes. But hungry as he is, all he has to eat are his dried D rations. And what's more, he's worried about his crew. Worried about his crew. Yes, it's a peaceful scene. A good fire, good food, good companions. But there are enemies present. Their worst enemies in the jungle, the female Anopheles mosquitoes, which fly from early dusk to late dawn and carry malaria. Malaria, which has caused more casualties to American forces in the Pacific area than the Japanese. Malaria discipline must be maintained at all times, especially at dawn and dusk. McVeigh makes sure that after dinner, each man takes an Atabrin pill. While Atabrin or quinine won't prevent malaria, it will suppress it until you can get medical attention. There are directions for use on each package. Be sure to follow them religiously. The other rules of malaria discipline are practiced too. Insect repellent should be used and renewed every couple of hours. The Anopheles doesn't like it, and she isn't the only one. The repellent also keeps them from being bothered by other annoying insect pests. Mosquito head nets and gloves should be worn from early dusk to late dawn. The crew remove theirs only long enough to eat. Since they're well smeared with repellent and near the fire, it's all right. They're doing pretty well. I'm not too worried about their pilot because they figure that by now, Harrison's probably at the wrecked plane, waiting. Harrison's waiting all right for morning. He can't sleep. And he's still hungry while a good dinner crawls through his tree. As you can see, he'd be hard to catch. He moves so fast. And this lizard looks like a bad dream, but it's a tasty dish. Wild fruit hanging over his head, good to eat. There's enough food right near him, but he doesn't know enough to go after it. So he stays hungry. The crew have eaten well, but want to provide for the next day. So Mel Ford decides to make a trap. Just lengths of split bamboo arranged log cabin style and tied with parachute cord. A simple trigger stick will spring the trap. Small animals are more likely to be attracted by food unfamiliar to them. A sacrifice of a small piece of chocolate D ration for bait may pay big dividends. He knows that the best place to set a trap is along an animal run leading down to a stream. He camouflages it, and just to help things along, builds a fence to force possible victims in the right direction. If you're interested in birds or small animals, try snares. Use a strong, supple branch as a spring and make your cord from the inner core of your parachute shroud line. All animals and birds are edible except for carrion birds, like the vulture. So almost anything you catch will be good to eat. Tannen sets his snares on a wild berry bush, and a cluster of the berries makes good bait. He could use any other fruit he's seen birds eat. Like Ford, he camouflages his snares and builds guides to force the birds or animals in. Bird enters snare. Branch springs back. Meat on the table. He hopes. Jungle streams are usually well stocked, loaded with fish. There are other ways to catch them besides using the tackle in the kit. A blazing torch or flashlight attracts them, brings them within range. A dip net is improvised from the pilot chute, fastened around a bent branch. 
Any fish living in freshwater streams are good to eat. That goes for eels and frogs, too. Shellfish are good, like this crayfish, which, boiled, is as good as shrimp. There are a few poisonous fish, but they occur only in brackish or salt water. The backside of the machete can also be used to kill fish. By nine o'clock, which is very late for the jungle, they are ready for sleep, well protected against mosquitoes and with their equipment under cover. They plan to rotate guards during the night to tend the fire, and if a plane happens over, to signal with the very pistol. Sleep is important. You need more of it in the tropics. You've got to conserve your energy and keep up your strength as a resistance against disease. And while they sleep, the jungle is working for them. Shortly before dawn, a tropical rabbit on his way to the stream for a drink. He can't make up his mind. That chocolate might be good. No, it might be bad. Well, it might be good. Too bad. The next morning, Ford and Tannen get up early to inspect their traps. Mel's got something, but he doesn't know what it is or how to get it out. He should make a pointed spear and kill the animal in the trap, but he's too excited to think. Ouch! Ford is a lucky, eager beaver if there ever was one. Tannin's snares have been busy too. Caught a fruit pigeon, which tastes like squab, and a larger, ugly looking bird. But ugliness, like beauty, is only skin deep. And once you get past the skin, there's good meat on those bones. Harrison is also doing some big game hunting. A porcupine, contrary to popular opinion, doesn't throw its quills. So Harrison could be a lot braver. That repulsive creature happens to be good to eat. But he's too squeamish. Something you can't afford to be in the jungle. The crew want to be well provisioned for the day's march. A parachute stretched across the stream and weighted down with stones makes a good net into which you can drive the fish. There's not much technique, just a lot of noise, splashing and beating. Spearing fish with a sharpened bamboo pole takes practice and patience. You've got a deflection shot because water bends light, so timing and lead are important. Not even a good gunner can hope to do this the first time, but it's not too difficult with practice. Before cooking, they skin and clean what they caught in the stream to get rid of the parasites. As for the rabbit, well, he never thought he'd get into the Air Force this way. They're well protected against early morning mosquitoes. Breakfast isn't elegant. The plates are wild banana leaves, but they serve the purpose very well. Food spoils quickly in the jungle. To preserve it, they cook all their fish and meat. Cut it in strips and hang it in the sun to dry. Drying strips over a smoking fire is another good way to keep food edible for several days. But they'll have to boil it before eating. They're looking ahead, playing it smart. And while they're eating, 10 miles away, Harrison is standing and drooling. He drools for minutes before the light dawns. Anything a monkey will eat is good for a man. A simple jungle rule it took him two days to get. He's so busy stuffing himself, he doesn't see trouble coming. Storm clouds. The crew sees them, though, as they're picking their way down the shallow stream, one of the fastest and easiest ways to travel in the jungle, if you can't find a trail. They don't waste any time getting to high ground. 
In the tropics, rain comes swiftly and heavily, and streams may flood in a flash. If it looks like rain, no time should be lost in providing shelter. You can build a lean-to in a hurry. It should be set up with the wind at the rear, and the slanting poles should be fixed against a firm base. A heavy log will do. For a floor, branches covered with sleeping bags. You can cover your lean-to with a parachute, but since it isn't completely waterproof, you should cover the parachute with leaves. Banana leaves are best if you can find them. Start at the bottom and work up, the way a house is shingled, so the rain will run off easily. Harrison is caught short again, with no time to rig up adequate protection. He could cover his shelter with the large leaves around him, but that might be using his head. A fire would be a big help. You'd think he'd know enough to strip the wet bark from his wood, or to whittle some dry shavings. Naturally, his fire is a great success. And so he sits and shivers and soaks. Although with a little common sense, he too could have had a fire under cover. And he too could have been warm and dry. The crew finds the food they'd preserved comes in handy. For dessert, wild pineapple, picked up along the way. Tannen feels a little sorry for the folks back home with pineapple 26 points a can. Even the rain works for them, filling open containers with good drinking water. The next morning, they reach the large river indicated on their map. The first leg is over, but they still have a long way to go. To get bamboo for a raft, Tannen crossed the river. As he tows the wood back, the crew throws rocks and makes more than enough noise to scare off what few crocodiles there are. He also keeps his clothes on, further protection, and wears his May West. It makes swimming a lot easier. Tannen doesn't know it, but he's brought back a friend. A friend who's gotten quite attached to him, a blood-sucking leech. He hasn't had time to dig in, so McVeigh is able to pull him off. When a leech is firmly fastened, you have to apply salt, iodine, or tobacco juice. Then he'll be glad to leave. Naturally, iodine should be applied at once to the wound. A raft should be built sturdily, with light wood, or lengths of bamboo tied with parachute cord and vines. Fibrous wood, like the palm, gets waterlogged easily and will sink. It looks like a big job, but it takes four men only two hours to build. It would take a man alone half a day to build one in a smaller size, but even then the time saved in travel would be worth it. You can cut oars with a machete, but you must remove the bark or your hand will blister. They balance the load so the raft won't tip. But just in case it does, they tie everything down tight and stow their most valuable things in their pockets. They're ready to travel the most efficient way, for the river is the express highway of the jungle. Besides leading down to the coast, native villages are found along the banks, and you're in the open where rescue planes can see you. Their next objective is their wrecked B-25, which they hope searching planes will spot. Tannen is assigned the lookout's job. He'll watch for snags and submerged logs which might upset them, and he'll listen for rapids or waterfalls ahead. They're on their way, and they know where they're going. Just like Harrison.
he's getting nowhere fast. He realizes it's impossible to go through a mangrove swamp. So he'll have to go around it, even though it's a much longer route. It takes him hours and plenty of luck to make the river at last. One look at that open mouth and the river doesn't look so hot. He doesn't know a rock or two would have sent the crocs on their way. And he thinks a raft is a job for a battalion of engineers. So back he goes into the jungle and doesn't even mark the rock in case natives or his own crew pass by. Later in the day, his crew, floating by that same rock, never knows Harrison has been there. They take advantage of this cook's tour to study the flora and fauna on the banks with the help of the jungle manual. Bread nut is a valuable addition to your menu. Bread fruit, common in the tropics and usually in season. Baked. It tastes something like potato and has as many uses. These rare and exotic tropical fruits, which look like bananas, are bananas. Yes, they do grow upside down. The fruit may be eaten raw, fried, broiled, or roasted. Soursop is another common fruit, which is good to eat raw or cooked. Hey, look it! Monkeys! It sounded like cannibalism when McVeigh read monkeys were good to eat. But Ford felt better when they told him monkeys are almost impossible to catch without a rifle. The tail of a young crocodile, well cooked, is as tasty as beefsteak, it says here. That's when Ford really loses his appetite and almost loses his breakfast. But if he were hungry, he'd eat a crocodile tail and like it. While almost everything in the jungle is edible, some plants must be cooked, like the elephant's ear, whose nourishing meat must be boiled in several changes of water. Plants and trees with a milky sap must be avoided, or they will cause a skin irritation worse than poison ivy. In the jungle, one of man's best friends is the bamboo. Not only does it make good cooking pots, rafts, and fishing spears, but the young shoots growing from the base of the tree are edible, raw, or better still, cooked. And as if that weren't enough, the older cracked bamboo stems sometimes contain water. The sun's heat is intense, but that shouldn't stop you from absorbing some sunshine vitamins if you're careful not to overdo it, even on cloudy days. Ten miles later, the sound of rapids ahead makes them decide to put ashore. If they'd wanted to, they could have floated the raft down the rough and rocky waters ahead by tying vines to it and guiding it along from the bank. But they plan to leave the river anyway, for according to their calculations, their plane is due west in the jungle not more than a few hours' march, and they're anxious to get to it as soon as possible. When they finally reach the plane, what's left of it, they get their first real shock. They'd expected to find Harrison. There's no sign of him. They yell themselves hoarse. But Harrison is miles away in the jungle, in serious trouble. He's lost his atabrin, and he's afraid he's coming down with malaria.
After a night's rest in hammocks, the best overnight beds you can make in the jungle, they start getting ready for the reconnaissance planes they know will be searching for them. Oil left in an oil line to saturate the firewood and make it send up a heavy smoke. Contrasting colors are more easily distinguished from the air, so everything white or yellow that will stand out against the dark jungle background is spread in the clearing. They destroyed all classified papers and tech orders. They smashed what secret instruments were left and buried the parts. If their plane had been intact and in enemy territory, they would have burned it. While they wait, they keep busy. McVeigh practices with the signal mirror. He knows it has to be aimed accurately for the reflection of the sun in the mirror to be seen by a passing plane. A pattern is thrown on his shirt through the clear cross in the center of the mirror. When this pattern is superimposed over or coincides with the cross in the mirror, the signal beam is aimed at whatever object is seen through the cross. If he hadn't a mirror, any shiny piece of metal would do almost as well. The emergency radio is beyond repair, but Tannen inflates the antenna balloon. Floating over the treetops, it can easily be spotted from the air. They do what they can, and wait, and hope. During the succeeding days, Harrison grows weaker. Panic is setting in again. He knows he's lost, and at the end of his rope. And then the next morning, his hope flares up again, when he hears what he's been praying for. He starts a fire quickly, but at best it's hard to make the smoke seen above the trees. He should have stayed on the river, in the clear. He should have prepared his fire in advance. He should have added more leaves to make more smoke. Yes, there are a lot of things he should have done. And now the possibility that he will die in the jungle, alone seems very real. It isn't long before the crew hears the same plane. Their long hours of preparation help them do things quickly and efficiently. Ford gets the fire started. Abbott crushes the May West sea marker die. It spreads across the stream, already marked by a suspended parachute. Tannen adds plenty of leaves to build the smoke blacker and higher, and it spirals upward into the sky. McVeigh uses his signal mirror. Practice makes perfect. They're spotted. Now they clear space for the signal panel. The jungle manual gives them the patterns for an even dozen messages. Indicate direction of nearest civilization. They watch the plane bank and fly due south. Need quinine or atoprin. They get more than they asked for. Two full boxes of food, arms, and supplies. If they needed one, they could ask for a doctor, and the plane would bring one back. He'd bail out to join them. The note tells them about a native village, 10 miles due south, 
where the natives are believed to be friendly. They collect their stuff and sling it over a pole for easier carrying. They leave a note for Harrison in case he makes the plane. It's in a box hanging high in the center of the clearing. Plenty of food and supplies too, well out of reach of insects and prowling animals. The signal panels left in full view have abandoned plane walking in this direction. They leave a trail a two-year-old could follow. Every direction marker recommended by the survival manual. They might have saved themselves the trouble. It's a trail Harrison will never see. He has malaria and there's nothing he can do about it. His legs and arms are heavy. He can barely drag himself along. That night, he just has strength enough to crawl into his shelter. He's shivering. His body turned to ice. The jungle, a gigantic refrigerator in which he's locked. And then the next morning, the jungle is an oven, baking him alive. He sweats and burns with fever. For hours, he lies there and suffers and drinks water he hasn't been able to purify. Not even that makes any difference anymore. The third day after leaving their wrecked plane, the crew reaches a native garden on the outskirts of the village they'd been searching for. They don't know how they'll be received. The village might throw a feast for them, or the village might make a feast of them. They decide to pool all the odds and ends and trinkets they're carrying, presents for the head man. They know that junk and a friendly smile will work wonders. McVeigh also gives them a few tips. Most native peoples, although they may seem inferior to you, have traditions and a culture which they value highly and which you must respect. If they want to, they can save your life. If not, well, the Japs are in the market and there are no ceiling prices. Besides, your good behavior may make it a lot easier for some other crew in a tough spot. The water around native villages is usually polluted. Don't drink it. Don't enter native huts. Don't eat native prepared foods unless a refusal will antagonize your hosts, in which case you've got to take a chance. And when you enter a village, let the people come and find you. They know you're there, even though you can't see them. Ford seems to be bothered. Uh-oh, she's not for you, soldier. She's one of three things that are taboo. The others are gardens and pigs. You're in enough trouble, so don't even look. McVeigh, in sign language, gets the chief to send a searching party for their pilot. It costs all of 75 cents, a lot more than Harrison is worth at the moment.
That night, they took care to pitch their camp outside the village, and they waited for some news from the native boys searching for Harrison. He's able to walk, for he has a benign tertian malaria, which hits every other day. Benign, that's a laugh. Between malaria attacks, he wanders on, but never very far. He's so hungry, he eats grubs and termites, which keep him alive, or a reasonable facsimile thereof. That's the way things stand at the 15th day. In the private war between the jungle and First Lieutenant Lynn Harrison Air Corps, the decision goes to the jungle, face down. He's dying, and it wouldn't have taken long if luck hadn't dealt herself a hand in the game. That's about all you can say for him. He was lucky. His crew cleaned him, fed him, dosed him with Adabrin, nursed him like a baby, and they pulled him through. During the days Harrison is recuperating, they keep diplomatic relations on an even keel. Ford's routine brings down the house. And then when Harrison is able to sit up, the village throws a party for him. In a few days, Harrison would be well enough to travel, and they'd head for the coast where they'd be picked up. Well, that's it, that's the works. Now, you've seen the jungle both ways. It can be tough, or it can be easy. Tough if you don't know what you're doing and you haven't got your equipment. And a lot easier if you follow the book. Now you can live in the jungle, even alone, and like it. But you've got to be prepared for it and you can't be afraid. There's only one answer to fear. Knowledge. So if you do land in the jungle, then land and live. <laughs>